Hello everybody. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to filter in. I'd like to double check with people that are watching that the sound is working, that you've been able to get in before I really get going. So as soon as anybody comes in, please let me know if the sound is working well and you are able to view this live stream. I'll be watching the uh, viewer count. Oh, perfect. You're already here. All right, great. So my viewer count says zero, but uh, obviously lots of you are here. Great. So welcome. Um, my name is Sam Snow. I am a professor at LSU, obviously. Um, I'm glad to see that some of you have usernames. If you don't already, um, it's worthwhile to to make some sort of username so that you can say hello. Um, I encourage you to um, go ahead and send a message if you have not already, just so that you know the process. Say hello, say hi. Um, this is going to be your way to interact with me through uh, this platform. If you put your name or your last name or some some slightly identifying thing here that'll help me understand who you are if you want to be known. It doesn't matter too much to me. Um, you're welcome to stay anonymous, but I, I do have to say that um, if somebody's saying something inappropriate or distracting, I reserve the right to just go ahead and ban you off the platform. Um, so don't do that because I can't distinguish you from somebody in the class. If that does happen, if you were asking a question and I did something weird, you can always ask me, but um, in general, my, my policy is going to be, I don't know who, who's actually here. Maybe it's um, some random person offline or a bot. And yeah, so that, that's my control here. Um, your chat here that you can see is the way that you're gonna be able to um, talk with me. And that'll be, um, useful. Hopefully I can have this. I, I need to change a setting. I'm going to make it so that this uh, chat you can see on the live stream as well. Um, if you don't have, if, you, if you're in full screen mode, but I'll fix that later. It's uh, not here at the moment. Okay. So um, essentially what I wanted to do today is first introduce you to this platform. Looks like at least 55 of you are here and lots of people saying hi, thank you. You guys are welcome to talk to each other here, welcome to uh, talk to me here. I'll be watching the, the chat happen as you say it. And so I'm gonna respond to any questions you have there. If we get to a point where we need some more individual face-to-face -face stuff, I will host Zoom calls for kind of office hours. Um, I'll do that by appointment, so just let me know, send me an email if you really um, are struggling with some concept, and I'll either open it to anybody welcome to, you know, wanting to come in, or I'll just do kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, based on the need. Great. Hello, everyone, and again, I'm sorry that we have to do it uh, virtually. I would rather be able to see your faces and um, get a feel for how interested you are or be able to have that face-to-face -face contact. So just bear bear with me. I will try to keep this as engaging as I can as I talk to a blank wall and a webcam and my screens. Um, so yeah, keep, keep it uh, entertaining or um, you know, as engaging as you're able to and I'll, I'll do my best as well. Okay, so class. Um, EVEG 3110, this is what everybody calls wastewater treatment. It's actually water and wastewater treatment. Um, and it's actually gonna feel a lot like just water treatment at first because the first maybe two thirds of the class we're gonna be covering um, topics that are technically or primarily in the uh, water treatment side of things. <clears throat> now, when we talk about wastewater. Um, a lot of the same technologies are going to work 
with water treatment and wastewater treatment. So really everything we're learning is kind of building on each other. And then in the last category, when we get to wastewater, it's going to be more about um, the biological processes that we make use of in wastewater treatment uh, to make everything happen. Okay, so I'd like to start talking about the, um, the basic premise of our class, uh, kind of a big picture topic. Why do we care about the environment? How do we care about it? How do we manipulate it, specifically in terms of water quality? Um, I've already run into a, a very small technical difficulty. I think I can fix it in just a moment, but I'll just go ahead and explain what I'm doing. I have this writing pad and a stylus and a little glove so that I'm not writing with my fingers on accident. I'm going to use this to write on the PowerPoint. Um, normally this on my uh, laptop, I, I do this and it just automatically takes the pen and puts it onto the PowerPoint for you. And right now it's on my home screen because um, I'm, I'm using two screens. So just to show you what, what's going on on my end, show you kind of what it looks like. So this is this is the screen that I see and right now my pen is working on the, the wrong screen. So I will be take I'm just going to take just a moment tested this earlier so let me see if I can um, you guys might as well see what I'm doing. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to restart the PowerPoint and see if that um, fixes it. And if this doesn't work, I will figure something else out. That'll work if I have to, but I, I still would like to change something a little bit. Okay. All right. So I'm going to fix this later. Got a good feel for it. At least something I can, I can manage for today. All right. So. When we talk about water treatment, <clears throat> basically what we're going to be doing is trying to take water that is dirty. You can imagine some uh, jar of water or something, and it's got a bunch of junk in it. Okay, if we have stuff in the water that we didn't want in the water. Well, most environmental engineering, and I understand that a lot of you are civil engineers, maybe some chemical engineers, so I'm going to kind of introduce just a little bit of a concept of environmental engineering here. Most of the time we have some pathogens or contaminants or maybe it's something that we want, we just want to process differently. Most of environmental engineering is about taking stuff that's in some medium, whether it's air or water, or maybe it's a mixture of groundwater and soil, sending it through some sort of process here and that process is going to maybe separate or transform the stuff in the media and then we have a nice little clean beaker of water and a pile of stuff that we can discard into a landfill or maybe we're gathering it maybe it's uh, we're decaffeinating coffee so we send coffee beans through a process and then then we separate it and we get the cough, the um, caffeine in the water, and then coffee beans, that, or it's probably some some other solution, and then just the coffee beans with no caffeine. <clears throat> so it's really almost all of the systems we're going to be dealing with have to do with 
this principle. We have stuff in the water, we enact some process on it, that takes some amount of time based on how quickly the reaction or the process occurs, and then maybe we, we've either separated it or grown stuff or killed stuff, and essentially we, our end result is a desire to change in the amount of stuff in here or the nature of the stuff in there. Um, maybe we're disinfecting and we can leave the dead cells in there so it's not actually separation, but that some transformation has happened. And really all of this is going to be on a basis of conservation of mass. And sometimes we will use that kind of analogously to conservation of number. So if we have some number of particles and then we're removing some of them, um, something like that. So that's going to be the, the basic premise of our course in a nutshell. Okay, so just a, a quick overview of what really is water treatment and what really is wastewater treatment. Water treatment consists of treating water so that we are um, able to drink it uh, or use it we call it potable water. So whenever we refer to just simply water treatment, or we talk about drinking water treatment, really we're looking at health standards, which we will break into a few different categories, including pathogens. So that would be kind of biological agents. Um, then we have chemicals. And sometimes we also add radionuclides. In terms of things that we are regulating. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna, I will be adding these PowerPoints to Moodle, um, and thank you for the question, I'm glad you're um, already asking questions here. I will add the PowerPoints to Moodle, and in the future what I'm gonna do is add the blank PowerPoint beforehand, and that way you can be filling it in as you go, and then I will also post uh, the filled-in version um, with with these notes. Hopefully I'll, I'll improve my handwriting here as I get used to this desk situation and the writing. Um, also once I have my pen situation figured out, I'll, next time it'll be a little easier for me to write uh, more clearly. Uh, but yeah, these, these will be added to Moodle along with um, a YouTube link that will be essentially this video captured um, Oh, one other thing on that note is when I do these streams, you're watching on Twitch, um, if you didn't catch it just now, but you come back, you know, in an hour or two, chances are that I have not, you know, it takes a while to upload to YouTube, so I probably have not gotten to that point yet. Twitch will save this whole stream for, I think, 10 days or something like that. So you're welcome to just go straight to the Twitch page to catch up on a lecture, and I'm also going to archive them on YouTube. So either, either one you want is fine with me. Um, the content will be in both places eventually. Okay, so uh, that that's basically it for the health standards here. We have basically anything that can harm human health, and then we regulate and treat these uh, issues slightly differently. There's also aesthetic standards. So even if the water is has some discoloration, maybe there's a little bit of rust in it or um, a little bit of organic matter, maybe it gives it some color or taste that people don't like, but it doesn't affect the health. That would be considered aesthetic. Water temperature, the amount of dissolved oxygen, those are all aesthetic standards. It turns out that drinking colder water um, is nice compared to drinking warmer water. Most people would like and prefer colder water. Um, okay, so there's a few aesthetic standards we can treat or consider as well. And then the wastewater treatment is really about protecting uh, whatever water is gonna receive the discharge of wastewater for any intended use. So we look around in Louisiana, there's lots of water everywhere, and we see, um, you know, an, beautiful bayous and, and different uh, wetlands and rivers, the, to protect the intended use, we have to understand what intended means. And that basically includes any recreation potential for using it um, as a supply for drinking water, um, fishing, boating, swimming, all of these things, and the ecology of the, of the water. 
because we as humans enjoy being in nature and enjoy, um, and maybe not everybody, but as a society, we like the ability to um, make use of and enjoy nature. So we want to preserve that as well. So there's lots of different uh, reasons we care about wastewater treatment, even if they don't have to attain to the same exact standards as if we're going to drink the water directly. Okay. So in terms of the course itself, um, I'll pull up the syllabus in just a moment, um, but essentially we have two exams and a final. The final will be partly comprehensive. As I mentioned earlier, the, the lecture material really does kind of build on itself. So at first we'll, we'll cover some basics starting today on you know, units, mass balances. Um, we'll go from there into a chemistry refresher in case any of you are um, feeling uncomfortable with chemistry. And then from, we'll continue and we'll go into some physical process of sedimentation, coagulation, then filtration, get into some chemical processes with disinfection, um, and then finally biological treatment and, and all that. But really the whole time we're going to be looking at how reactions are occurring, how quickly this happens, and how to uh, build a system and design a system according to how quickly we can disinfect or um, grow bacteria to eat the, the junk in the wastewater. In addition to the, so that's, we've got exams, we've got homeworks, and so we'll look at the syllabus in a moment, but essentially this will be uh, 100 points per, per exam. So the final counts the same as the midterms and the homeworks will be 100 points uh, as an average of all four. And then these participation quizzes, these are going to be most of the points you'll get just for participating. Um, and then it'll be some fraction, maybe I think in the syllabus I have 75%. So at minimum 75% credit, you'll get just for answering the questions. Um, this is a way for me to engage you with some of the, the topics that we cover that, that aren't strictly quantitative. So the homeworks and exams are going to be strictly quantitative. Um, this, this portion is going to be um, helping me measure and ensure that you are also learning something qualitative, um, meaning, you know, if we if we better understand how water treatment works, maybe we can better understand what went wrong with the Flint water crisis and what happened there. So even if there's maybe not a number to be solved in all of those topics, um, this is more where I'm gonna test that uh, learning. And in terms of grading in general, my, my system uh, is, I want to test uh, that you have learned um, yeah, I want to grade based on how much you've learned. That's my goal. So if an exam, you know, if I make it too easy, I'm not really testing what you've learned. If I make it too hard, um, the grade's not reflecting, uh, not reflecting that you learned as much as you did, uh, typically. So in my grading, I try to make exams challenging to the point where um, I really can see how much you've learned and if I made it too challenging then I have curved exams in the past. So if you just feel like I, I made an exam completely um, you know way too hard chances are you know and all your friends are saying the same thing chances are I, I may end up curving that if if the grades are are too hard. But I do try to stretch the exams a little bit past what we've directly solved in person. Part of that's because, especially with the online system, I, I kind of have to change the problems a little bit so that you guys aren't just finding the solution somewhere uh, online. Okay, there was a question, will the participation quizzes um, happen every week? That's my goal is to give you approximately one per week covering some of the, the topics. Um, I typically don't do it the first week or so while there's still the drop ad um, happening. 
I'll, I'll do my best to get something posted for you by the end of next week. And so you'll have um, probably one per week for the semester. Typically what I would, I would normally do is, you know, in a live lecture, I used to do these Kahoot quizzes and then use that as kind of participation or just attendance and get more, more grades for that. Um, so it, I ended up last semester not giving as many quizzes as I wanted to. That means if somebody missed it or, you know, there was some problem that was taking too much uh, credit away for somebody who wanted to participate and um, had some issue or missed it. So I'll work with you on that if, uh, if we need. Okay, the textbook um, is right here. This is an, a great book. It's um, got a lot of fundamentals beyond just water treatment, some environmental science um, and general environmental engineering as well. So we're going to focus on really the water treatment chapters in that book um, primarily. So for the um, syllabus we have right here, this if essentially so far we've covered, um, well you're in the class right now so we've got that covered. Um, that's the textbook. There's some other resources listed here. You don't have to use these directly. Um, don't feel like you need to buy these. I would recommend that you get access to this book, the required one. It's going to be helpful. I've posted on Moodle um, a list of problems that may be helpful to study from. So you'll see that in Moodle already. And there's going to be um, most of the course will be coming directly from here. So I'm going to use their nomenclature, their symbols, all of that as, as best I can. I'm going to add from a couple of these books occasionally. Um, our required textbook does not have much on membrane filtration, so we're adding a little bit of that. Um, these ones are just resources if you're interested. Most of them are available online, um, if not all of them. Okay, so then we were talking about grading. Um, here it is. I will also give up to five bonus points at the end of the semester, depending on the ratio of you that participate in the online course evaluation. I don't know who participates, so I can no longer assign directly whether or not you participated, but if 90% of you participate, then you will all get four points. Um, and in fact, maybe I'll go ahead and bump it up to five if, you, if I get over 90% participation. Okay, I'll, I'll remind you of that um, later. Okay, and this should say four, not five. Okay, so midterms, um, obviously it's not in class, so I need to update that. Um, last semester we were hybrid, so I was able to do uh, exams in class. Exams will essentially be take home. Um, it's going to be a situation where I give you uh, the exam file on Moodle, you have a set amount of time to take it, upload your answers in Moodle and your scratch work in Moodle. That way I can um, go back through and manually add partial credit where I see fit. And part of the grading will be automated. Okay, um, I explained participation attendance. Um, I will say that I'm I'm really grateful that so many of you are here live, and I, I hope that you feel free and um, do this for your own sake to participate live, because I think it's probably going to be helpful for you to sit down and have a moment where you're able to ask questions and to kind of commit to the routine um, class environment, whereas I know that online learning and all of that is, is pretty tough. Um, so having that scheduled time hopefully will be helpful to you, but if there's a challenge, feel free to watch later. I'm not disappointed or angry or anything if you decide that 1 a.m. is the best time for you to watch my lectures. I might not understand that, but that's, that's fine. It's your choice. I'm, I'm happy for you to do that if that works for you. Um, they will also be, you know, these will also be posted to Moodle and as a YouTube link. So if it works better for you to speed it up or slow it down, um, 
I know that you should be able to pause and play, maybe even rewind on the Twitch stream. So if that's that may be helpful for you live, um, but you can certainly also do that with YouTube. Okay, I've got a general um, structure for the um, the topics that we're going to cover. So feel free to take a look here. I've also um, added the the readings from our book um, where they correspond to. I'm gonna in a couple cases I'll supplement or add things on Moodle. So take a look here. Um, I went ahead and looked up the the schedule for the final exam. This is what it looks like as of a day or two ago when I generated this. Um, should be April 27th at 5:30 p.m. So it looks like our, our semester, since we don't have the spring break, is a bit shorter. Um, so we can expect to be done before May. Okay, so that's, that's about it for the syllabus. If there's any questions, please let me know. Um, the last page was just more discussion about the online participation and giving you instructions to get here and all that. Okay, so that's that PowerPoint. Okay, I've got another one uh, to get going with. Before we really get going with this one, this would be kind of our first lecture materials. Um, what I'd like to do is have you um, participate with a um, interactive so a Kahoot. Normally I won't be doing this. Um, let's see if that works. So normally I won't use Kahoot. I used to use it all the time because we had, you know, X number of people in the classes. Um, since I'm letting you be asynchronous or synchronous, I'm not going to rely on this as a, um, I'm not going to rely on this as a way to get your feedback or to um, get your participation because it forces you to be live. Um, because I'm allowing the asynchronous, I'm only going to do this today just to kind of get to know you a little bit better. So go ahead and go to kahoot.it um, and log in with this number, as you see a lot of people are doing. Um, we'll get going here in a minute. And I'll start it up. But essentially, what this is, this is going to be a, a chance to get to know you. Um, so while you sign into here, I'm going to have have you interact one more time on the Twitch stream. Can you just post in Twitch where you're watching from? Um, and it can just be home. I'm going to say home office for me. That's where I'm uh, streaming from today. Maybe sometimes I'll be in my. Uh, Patrick Taylor office, maybe dorm, apartment, you know, vacation, Hawaii, you know. Um, if you have anything interesting, feel free. Awesome. So a few of you are hanging out in PFT. Nice. Okay, and once once we've got about 75 or so people here, I'll, I'll go ahead and start this little Kahoot thing. I'll use this also to explain a little bit about um, myself, where I'm from, because I'm going to be asking you some of the same questions. All right. And if anybody ends up joining later, you can, you can join at Kahoot.it this code. Okay. Nice. So it's not, um, it's not mandatory that you get in here. It's just kind of a fun little game we'll do real quick. Um, might use this as an excuse to test out the audio, make sure the 
desktop audio comes through if I want it to. Um, we'll go ahead and begin. Again, feel free to join. Okay, so first question, what's your major? How's the audio too? Is it coming through? Okay. All right, I'll just go ahead and mute it. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, so as is fairly typical, we have a majority of you are civil engineers, um, a few EVEG majors, some chemical engineers and some others. Um, if you're other, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I know sometimes we get petroleum engineers or some others. Um, so feel free if you want. Um, myself, my training, my undergraduate was actually not engineering. It was earth and atmospheric science. Um, I did that at Georgia Tech. And that program was pretty math heavy because there's a lot of meteorologists and they need a lot of math. We also had thermo, stuff like that. So I had some of the engineering background and I ended up going into environmental engineering for my graduate degree. Um, so I switched departments but kind of kept the same water quality type of focus um, for both majors. So I've always been studying water treatment or water quality in some form. Um, and I, I graduated my bachelor's in 2009 and then my PhD in 2014. Okay, next up, how many years have you been at LSU? <clears throat> okay, biological engineering, nice. Mm. You know, the music makes it a little, mm. a little more engaging, we'll get it. <clears throat> you third years super senior um, a few of you yeah in, in kind of the super senior category or maybe uh, taking it early or something a few of you transferred okay that's that's fairly typical not quite as many fourth years as a you know, sometimes this proportion is about reversed or somewhere between all right how old are you um, I am certainly in the green category here. I'm 33. And I've been at LSU since 2016, so technically this is my fifth year at LSU. And I've been teaching this class every semester, so hopefully this is going to be the best, the best time so far. All right, so got a youngin. Got uh, most of you. 20 to 21, matches up pretty well with third and fourth years, and a few of you, um, 25 or more. Cool. Okay, so where are you from? And by that, I mean, where did you spend most of your childhood? You can really answer however you feel like. Um, for me, I grew up in Georgia, a little bit north of Atlanta, kind of Atlanta suburbs. So technically, I guess I would be, um, I would be yellow here because it's more than, it's technically three states away. All right, so 70% of you, Louisiana, um, got New York, got a few um, international or um, transplants, California, also outside of Atlanta, cool. Uh, what part? I was up in um, Woodstock. And yeah, feel free to, if you if you'd like. If you're from some other country, okay, nice. Um, if you're from some other country, feel free to chime in and let us know uh, where you're from or where where you grew up, rather. Okay, China. 
thank you all for interacting. This is this is great. I'm glad that you're um, you're able to, to kind of be here, even if it's you know not really in person. Okay, which topic are you least comfortable with? Chemistry, physics, engineering, math, or you're pretty much a boss at comfortable with all of these. Sorry, I was talking through that, so didn't give me enough time there. But still, we have five of you either mashed the wrong button or are feeling like you're, you're gonna ace the class. <laughs> That's fun. Um, I always like to ask that question and I, so I, don't, I don't see who answers it, so I'm always kind of curious. Um, but pretty typical, um, we usually see a lot of people are uncomfortable with chemistry. So for those of you who are chemical engineers and are feeling like pretty much a boss, at least at chemistry, um, feel free to tune out for um, the next lecture or two. I'm mostly covering some basics of chemistry. Um, that would be a good opportunity for you just to kind of skim through, see what I'm covering. Yeah, maybe I'm, I might introduce concepts that are gonna be helpful if you haven't used them in a while, um, but I don't mind if you, if you already feel comfortable, you know, especially with the online format, um, maybe just come back and watch uh, later when you're, um, when we're starting the other topics. But first couple days, I'm gonna help out the chemistry phobes, the ones that don't really like chemistry um, or are concerned about their, their level of chemistry knowledge uh, so that they can catch up a bit. Okay, so speaking of chemistry, what do you think about when you see this chemical structure? Okay, so a lot of you correctly identified that, <laughs> yes, um, identified that uh, Fe is iron, and you saw the O, so maybe some sort of iron oxide. Good guess. Um, seven of you are know enough about chemistry to know that this is um, <laughs> this is an impossible structure. Um, Eleven of you got the pun, so this Fe. Uh, 2 plus is what we call ferrous iron, and so it, it was a wheel, it looks like a ferrous wheel, so it's a pun. Um, and 9 to do you just hate chemistry and are, are no fun. Um, so the reason I put this here is because I actually, I actually have a t-shirt, an old t-shirt, I'll wear it for you one of these days, um, with basically that or some similar thing, and it's, it's just a chemistry pun. And that's actually the reason I remembered the difference between ferric and ferrous, because ferric is Fe3+, and ferrous is Fe2+, and I, I've never forgotten since owning that t-shirt that my sister gave to me. All right, um, on that note, do you enjoy a good pun? This is one of my favorites to actually see uh, see your faces in in person because it can be kind of hilarious. flies like an arrow, fruit flies like banana. Um, that was most of you. Whiteboards are truly remarkable. Um, some of you hate puns, but I made you, made you answer a pun anyway. And uh, some of you, you know, once I moved it at least, um, said, I'd tell you a chemistry joke if I knew I'd get a reaction. All right. There you go. All right, cool. 
good demonstration of um, how I'm setting up my my board here too, so that we can. So hopefully your viewing pleasure, your your viewing ability is uh, unimpeded. So when you see um, the uh, notes in the class, this is essentially what it looks like for me. That's fun. I might try to do that more often, um, especially if it's a, a good way to keep you guys engaged and interacting. Um, but again, I do, I do hope to allow you to uh, participate remotely if, if that works best for you, or asynchronously if that works best for you. All right, so any, any questions about the course or the um, kind of high level stuff? course related materials you feeling okay about participating this way so far <clears throat> good all right so as always feel free to um, chime in if you do have questions glad to see that and again thank you for participating it, it really is um, helpful for me to be able to just see, even if you're just saying yes, you feel like it's not very help, you know, not very impactful. It does help, especially when I have no faces to look at <laughs> and to um, see, see reactions in, in real time. Um, by the way, does it, any of your other professors use a method like this or is it all kind of um, a pet lizard? No, that, there's um, a fish in there. I might end up moving the aquarium to here to put some bookshelves back there are still we just bought this house last year in august and i'm still sort of arranging things um i'll uh i'll try to um put a second webcam there so you can watch the fish instead of my face uh, sometimes if you like um, but we'll get we'll get there in a couple weeks cool okay yeah so Keep telling me, um, okay, first time for Twitch for a lot of you. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a funny platform because uh, mostly it's a, people use it for gaming. Um, I've never streamed a game. I do play some computer games here and there, so I was fam familiar with it. Um, and then when the pandemic happened, I was just like, you know, I, I don't fancy having 70 mics that are supposed to be muted and trying to talk during that. Um, and I knew I could just put a little webcam and have the picture. So um, I thought this was a, a better solution. Um, and I'm hopeful that you guys agree. All right, so coming back to class, we'll, we'll get through a little bit of material. Hopefully this will help us, um, help us uh, not get behind. Um, What's the other channel? I don't know. Hmm. What other channel? It might just be some random. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what other channel it's talking about. Um, so. You'll have to enlighten me. Maybe I, I have clicked a channel on it before or something, and it's showing something else that um, I was looking at or taking an example from or something. Oh, my gaming channel. <laughs> I, I know it's it's kind of funny. I don't have a gaming channel. I I don't stream games. I'm only streaming uh, lectures. I might do that someday. And if I do, I'll, I'll share it with you guys. But at the moment, I literally, um, I'm that much of a nerd that my first first stream has been lectures. <laughs> okay. All right. So units and mass balance. So coming back to class and the topics here, um, I mentioned earlier that really what we're interested in is is the 
way in which we take stuff in some media, so take stuff in water and extract it or separate it or transform it. When we work with especially water and concentrations, um, we really have to keep a good grasp of the units. And so I will stress this over and over again that the units are essential. And when you're solving a problem, it's really important to know if you have if you have very heavy blocks, let's say, let me get my pen working. One moment. Pen, please. Yeah. If you have really heavy, large um, objects on a scale and compare that with lightweight ones, even though you have more, you can see there's going to be an obvious difference just intuiting that, right? The, the scales are going to do one thing or the other. So when we talk about units, every problem is going to have units that are important. So if you ever start getting confused on the unit side of things, um, that's a really good signal for you that you probably need to take the time to study and better understand what's happening with the units. When you solve problems, I really encourage you to go write out the units. Um, even if it feels repetitive, uh, at least write them out when you at, at some point in your problem solving and always give the units at the end. I can give you partial credit if I understand, oh, you, miss, you messed up the units, but that was the only thing you messed up. Okay, so always use your units, pay attention to your units. Those are gonna help you. If you forgot part of an equation, um, units can help you remember or unlock that equation for you. All right, mass balance. And, and by the way, on the note for equations, I'll show you, actually I can go ahead and pull it up now. Um, for our exams, we're gonna have formulas and tables and a sheet like this. So this will be on your exams. I'll give you this file. Uh, we're gonna have a periodic table, this uh, sheet here that has, and we'll cover this again in a moment, and several equations. So as we go through the course, I'm gonna add more equations here for you. Uh, this way you have basically what you need in front of you. Um, it's kind of like an open book type of exam anyway. Um, but essentially you're gonna have these equations and I'm gonna ask you to remember a few simple equations and I'll cover those when we get there. Um, but units for those simple equations in particular, if you have forgot how to solve for, let's say the hydraulic retention time of water, which is a very simple equation, but you know the units, you can solve that uh, relatively easily. Okay, all of basically all of chemistry has to do with units and converting from uh, the number of something to the mass of something. So if we have, you know, how do you compare five eggs to five kilograms of eggs? You have to weigh one individual egg and then decide how much, um, you know, how much mass is there in one egg, and then you convert, can, convert, can convert from the number of eggs, how many dozen of, of eggs is five kilograms. Um, so that's gonna be an analogy we're gonna use to understand molar conversions. I'm gonna keep all the assignment problems, all the exam problems and most of the assignment problems to SI units. If there's a homework problem that's converting gallons to liters, yeah, I'll let you look that up. I'm not too worried you can do that. Uh, but I'm not gonna make you do that on an exam. So for exams, what I do want you to be familiar with is certainly the prefix, suffix, you know, prefix sim, um, system for SI conversions, right? Um, I certainly expect you to remember what a kilogram is, um, and you should probably be pretty familiar, maybe deci, but especially centi, milli, um, micro, and nano will all be relevant to our class. This is stuff you've learned before, I'm just drawing your attention to it again. The fact that you can do milliliters, you can do millimeters, uh, milligrams, and 
you should be fluent and comfortable converting all those from you know, the base unit to one of these. Um, in the table I just showed you, this is the table you're going to have on your exams, a note about the importance of units here. As part of the unit for dynamic viscosity, which you will use quite frequently, we see it gives the units in kilograms per meter second, but it also contains this times 10 to the minus third. So when you're solving problems and you're solving for mu, or you have to find mu, and you see mu at 15 degrees Celsius in the water, this corresponds to 1.139. Don't forget to include the units, and the units are times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per meter per second. That was pretty ugly. Okay, so that's that times 10 to the minus 3 here is really important because it's actually 0 0.001139, right? So that, that component of the units found up here is going to be really important. So make sure you um, keep that in mind. Okay, a few other ones to make sure that you keep um, in your memory. I expect you to be able to convert between liters and cubic meters. This is going to be something we have to do pretty frequently. We're going to be dealing with concentrations in milligrams per liter, and then we're going to be dealing with volumes in cubic meters. So a cubic meter is a unit of volume. A liter is a, a unit of volume. We have to be able to convert the two to understand how many milligrams are in the total volume there. So it turns out that you can fit 1,000 liters in one cubic meter. There's a couple simpler um, things you could commit to memory and then convert back there. So in terms of the, the liters, you could just commit this to memory and that will help. You will need this and I'm not giving it to you um, on your formula sheet. I just expect you to, to memorize that one. You could also memorize the fact that one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. Okay, uh, so that's that's another um, relationship you could commit to memory, and then you convert when you take, you know, one thousand milliliters in one liter, and you also take uh, that one centimeter. And you have to, you say, okay, one, so 100 centimeters in one meter. Well, you have to cube the 100 when you convert this to get cubic meters. And you'll see this is, turns out to be 10,000 cubic centimeters, or excuse me, um, is that? It's 100 cubic centimeters. Uh, is that 1 million? Um, that many cubic centimeters in one cubic meter. And since you know this is one to one, that turns out to be, it, it turns out to be a thousand liters when you convert, um, you divide, yeah, it should be a million then. So that turns out to be one million cubic centimeters in one cubic meter. And that's the other way you can um, do the conversion. Okay, that's kind of messy, so I'm gonna erase it. Okay, so a quick challenge for you. How many grams are in one milliliter of water at five degrees Celsius? So this is gonna make use of the density chart we were just looking at. So if we take um, the density of water at five degrees Celsius is exactly 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. This is actually how we've defined a kilogram. Um, so at five degrees Celsius, um, what was it? It was one, 1,000 kilograms, kilograms of water per cubic meter of water. Okay, so take a moment and 
solve that. Good, so we've got some answers coming in. Yeah, feel free to post your answer or your guess, um, and I'll go ahead and start kind of deriving this in a, a methodical manner for you. Okay, so grams in one milliliter. We know how many kilograms are in one cubic meter, so we could say um, you know, 1,000 kilograms is equal to, that's at 10 to the three kilograms, equal to 10 to the six grams. Okay, so I just took the, the shortcut there, um, simplified it. So that's in one cubic meter. So we know that's the same as saying 10 to the six grams in 1000 liters based on our relationship. And so if we divide, um, if we divide that, that's uh, 1,000 grams per liter. And we know there's 1,000 milliliters per liter right here. So we can say that's equal to 1,000 grams per 1,000 milliliters equals one gram per milliliter which is the other definition you can remember if you'd like. Could because you can go from here at five degrees Celsius using that density and convert back to under back to your definition of 1000 liters in every cubic meter. Okay, so that's uh, good that you were able to do that. Okay. I mentioned this already, but that conversion between number to mass. So we might have some object, maybe a balloon. If we say we have five balloons and we want to know the mass, we compare that to five other objects that have the same volume, but they happen to be bowling balls. We can see immediately there's going to be a big difference in the mass contained in these spheres when we compare the two. So when we're comparing chemicals, this is really the important key, right? We cannot compare balloons and bowling balls directly, but sometimes we have to compare on the number value. So we can't compare their mass just based on the number. There's a, a significant difference here. Um, so essentially, what we have to do is use a conversion. Our conversion, as we'll touch back up with the, the chemistry, is really the mass per atom. And this becomes mass per, because if one atom is, it's too difficult to really just define one atom. Um, so instead we say mass per some arbitrary 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. And that's how we define one mole. So that's the mass per mole. Now, the reason we do this is because, like I said, one mole is not very um, conceivable. It's hard to understand how much mass there is in one atom because we can't perceive one atom. Now grams is maybe a gram of or a few grams of water remaining in here in my my water my glass of water. Um, we can see that I don't know if you can see it in the video very well but um, you can see physically that there's maybe a couple grams and it turns out that if we define 
our mass in a way where some portion that's like you can feel it one gram or maybe 20 grams is one mole of some molecule that's much more reasonable in terms of what we can uh, conceive um, ourselves this system is actually very familiar to you in a different manner and that has to do with essentially the a dozen eggs right we are very familiar with what one dozen eggs looks like feels like you know yeah sure you you understand one egg but you also understand one dozen eggs so the term mole is going to be exactly like the term dozen okay it's the same operator it's one dozen is 12 of something one mole is this number of something so if you're getting confused with molar conversions um, we're going to keep it we're going to um, simplify this and talk about it in a way that's hopefully going to help you understand um, the premise now the reason chemistry sometimes requires this number analysis and actually some of the other systems will too is because typically chemical reactions are happening in terms of the number of atoms or the number of molecules that are interacting with each other it's not just the the weight of them the mass of them it's actually the number of molecules that are there uh, so it turns out most of our chemical reactions require that numbers basis for us to, to work with okay so given that we need the numbers basis we need to understand concentration because we need the number of stuff in solution now concentrations we can use mass or number so we can do milligrams per liter or we can do moles per liter or we could do simply the number of pathogen cells per liter there's all sorts of um, ways to define this we can have different denominators so different um, different volumes we can use kilo, kilograms uh, excuse me uh, liters cubic meters we could use percent by volume so what volume of your system is of your um, alcoholic beverage is alcohol by volume you could do that um, you could use mass you could say how many grams of this bag of sand is actually dirt instead of sand you could have okay five grams for every 20 grams of sand um, you could do how many milligrams per kilogram of stuff so we can define the mass um, define the, the denominator of our concentration in different manners we can also do percent by weight so sometimes especially in air quality studies you might see people talking about what mass of particles are there per um, kilogram of air okay and that's that's a lot of air and you'll have maybe some milligrams or nanograms micrograms of mass hello hello um, in that in that amount and that's going to be your concentration it's just going to be a mass concentration so the percentage is actually very similar to these um, we can expand percentage beyond one out of a hundred if we say one out of a thousand we actually start calling that parts per thousand and there's a special little symbol here that can be used it's one little zero over two zeros um, essentially that's one in a thousand whereas percent is normally one out of a hundred like one percent is one over 100 this guy one part per thousand is one over 1000 we can have parts per million one out of a million and parts per billion and so on um, usually this is mass but really we can use um, mass or volume uh, in that denominator okay so we're going to use some if not all of these um, so just be familiar with the fact that we can have different denominators in our concentrations okay 
Um, and here we get a little bit of a egging action. So the numerators can also change. So we can have mass or number. So milligrams per liter of uh, hypochlorite here. This is one of the forms of bleach. So we could have some milligrams per liter of bleach, or we could have the number value. So we could have particles per liter, or what we see as our molar units. So one mole of X, that's what I said earlier, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's the, that number of X. That's just the same as saying one dozen of X is 1.2 times 10 to the one. So 1.2 times 10 is 12, right? 10 to the one is 10. Um, so one dozen of X is 1.2 times 10 to the one of X. It's the same thing as saying one mole of x equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of x. It's just a lot bigger of a number. So the question is, how many eggs does it take to properly egg one car? And the reason I'm asking this question is because one egg, if anybody can give me a guess on how much mass, and I'm going to say one car. I'm just going to estimate one mole of x. Um, that would uh, probably crush crush the Earth if you if you were to achieve one mole of x. We'll we'll do that in just a second. Okay, so one car is probably two two thousand kilograms. Let's say um, two thousand pounds, maybe. So maybe maybe more like one thousand kilograms. Probably a light car. Okay, so can you can you guess what you know what how many eggs given that we have one thousand kilograms? Well, you might be thinking to yourself, you know, just a one for every window and door handle, so a dozen, something like that. If you were to try to compare this on a number basis, one car to one egg is not enough. Okay, what about one pound of eggs per pound of car? That's going to be way too many. Um, and if you took 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd eggs, not 33rd, that's a very adventurous um, estimation there. Um, we'll calculate that mass in a second, but first we need to have some example of you know, how much does one one egg weigh? I'm not sure exactly. We could look it up if I could measure perhaps. But let's just assume um, that it's like 100 grams, okay? So 100, let's see if I can do this. Oh, no. We'll do it in Excel. 50 grams, okay. We'll use 50 grams. Okay, so we've got 50 times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, That's that many grams. That would be, if we take that and divide it by a thousand, that's 3.01 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. Okay, so can somebody Google for me how much mass is in the earth? Um, our estimate for that. So we'll see how much, how we compare one mole of eggs compares to the earth. Okay, if it's 50 grams, and that, you know, that's way too many eggs. My point is just that we can't compare, even if we did, um, okay, so that many eggs is literally more 
Um, okay, almost as much, almost as heavy as the Earth. Okay, so not not so bad. We didn't really destroy the Earth too much. We just mostly destroyed it. Okay. Anyway, the point is you can't decide 1,000 eggs because, you know, we have 1,000 kilograms. So as we're doing conversions, we can think of chemical reactions as, look, you need, if you decide that there's an egg for every windshield window or something, and don't egg cars, that's not my point here, but um, that you have a set number, right? You, you're trying for optimal meanness and destruction with minimal cost. So you, you're gonna have, you know, X number of eggs per car. It's not on a mass basis. That's, that's a analogy that hopefully will stick with you. Um, a little bit in your face, I know, all the puns. Um, but basically I would just want that to help you understand and conceptualize what it means to have, um, to have the molar units take away some of the stigma against them that you remember from high school chemistry that it was so annoying and you didn't understand and blah, blah, blah. All right, so molar units, um, basically I said this already, when we took a, take a look at the periodic table, we'll have all these elements and you'll see here, a uh, number on top, that's gonna be the atomic number, that's the number of uh, protons inside it, in the, inside that atom. It also corresponds to, um, and this is how we number them, right? So hydrogen is one, helium is two, lithium is three, and so on. And that's, we number them that way based on how many protons they have, that gives them different characteristics because that also corresponds to the number of electrons they have. The weight, the atomic mass, is this bottom one. This is one we care about. That's the one where we say, you know, one mole of hydrogen is 1.00794 grams of hydrogen. Don't worry about it, but that's because sometimes there's a neutron on it. On average, most of them aren't, don't have it, but some of them do, and that averages in to here. Because if it was just a proton, it would be exactly one, because that's how we've defined it. Okay, the point here is that you look and you find that number, and then you have that number to mass ratio. So you can say that one, um, one times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of hydrogen there's that many atoms in hydrogen in every 1.00794, you don't normally need this kind of precision, um, grams of hydrogen. So that's your number to mass ratio, okay? That's what lets you convert from moles to mass. And so when we have a molecule of H2O, and we wanna know how many moles um, are in you know, one liter, of pure water, we could do that calculation, right? And what we do is we say, okay, we have two hydrogens, the H2, so that's two, plus whatever oxygen weighs, which if you look at the periodic table, it's pretty much 16. So the molecular weight is 18 grams per mole, because we define all of these numbers here as the same as grams per mole. That's, um, we could also look at it at as one atom um, per atomic mass units, but it's, yeah, don't worry about that. Um, it's just basically on the atomic level. It's, you divide gram, divide the amount in grams by uh, a mole, and there you go, about, by Avogadro's number, 6.02. Um, so one other thing to consider here, so this is grams per mole, when we put it into concentration, for molar concentrations, we're doing moles per liter, and we will abbreviate this as capital M. This is standard convention. Um, we often do that. And so when we're using moles per liter, molar units, this is going to be a number concentration, number per volume, okay? That's like a dozen, how many dozen, 
eggs are floating in your boiling water to boil water. So our shorthand for molar units is, are these brackets. So when we write brackets of H+, plus, this is going to be moles per liter of H+. Plus. Whenever you see these brackets, you have to be using moles per liter. It can't be millimolar, it can't be milligrams, it has to be moles per liter. Okay, so these brackets should be a tip-off for you that we're dealing with moles per liter. Okay, just a, a quick couple more things here. For numbers, we often use number concentrations for, let's say, disinfection. And you'll see this on Lysol bottles or different other products. Kills 99% of germs or whatever. Um, that's calculated on a number basis. Essentially, they expose some germs, some pathogen or surrogate to the disinfectant, and then they count how many are remaining. So we usually use N as a concentration, a number concentration. That will be the number of germs per volume of water that we're dealing with. Sometimes we will report this in terms of colony forming units or plaque forming units based on if it's a bacteria or a virus. That just has to do with how we count it in a petri dish. Usually we'll, we'll see these little colonies growing and once they've grown for a long time, they, they become a visible colony and we can say, oh, this started from one bacteria cell and then grew into this colony here. And so if we poured one milliliter of solution into our Petri dish and spread it all around, then we can say, oh, hey, look, we have six colonies per milliliter. That corresponds to 6,000 per liter. And so our number concentration then is 6,000 um, colonies, colony forming, forming units, CFUs, per liter. Um, if this was one milliliter onto this plate and then we calculated it. That's where the CFU is coming from or the plaque forming for the viruses. A lot of times what we're going to do is compare how much we have before we do the experiment or before we do the disinfection compared to afterwards. So N0 is going to be initial and then N is final. So if we have 99% reduction, it would be as if we had, let's say, 1,000, so N0 equals 1,000. If, we, if we're dealing with 99% removal, that means that our N has to be 1% um, of that what we started with. So it's gonna be 10, and if we do, 10 over 1,000, this should be 0 0.01, and that's going to be, um, if we take 1 minus 0 0.01, that's going to be 0 0.99, and we see that connection here to that 99%. Okay, I'm going to pick up here next time, and our next slide is actually going to basically repeat what I just did and elaborate on it a little bit more. So that'll be a good time to pick up next time. That gets us through uh, the majority of what I normally cover in kind of my first lecture. I think our schedule is a little tighter this semester, so I wanted to go ahead and get through most of that. Thank you all again for participating in person as best we can. Thanks for exploring um, the Twitch platform with me. Um, and chatting and doing the Kahoot as well. I do plan to try to have about one quiz per week. I'll post that to Moodle. You'll have plenty of time to do it during the week and then a limited time to actually complete it. Um, that would be normally what I do for participation. Um, but I really do appreciate you guys being uh, here to confirm that the stream is working and all of that. Um, and to give me some sort of feedback so I'm not just talking to a computer screen. All right, with that, I will end here and I will see you guys um, on Thursday. All right. <laughs>
Okay. Goodbye for today.